I'll be very brief so that we have plenty of time uh, to listen to you and to, to chat with you. Um, but I'm very happy to moderate this panel. My name is Tom Vanderark. Uh, I, I have a public affairs company and uh, an education venture fund, and I spend all of my time thinking about uh, disruptive innovation in education. So I'm, I'm happy to have the, the panel that we have here. I, I want you to think about something uh, with me during this hour, and then let's, let's talk about it in, in a half hour when, when we do a Q&A. Uh, I recently made a set of 40 predictions about the future of American education. I think it's one of my better blogs of the last month. Uh, look it up if you haven't seen it. It was about a week ago on edreformer.com. Um, one, one of my uh, predictions is that on August 20, 2012, American education will change. There'll be a pivot uh, from print to digital. Um, I think enough states and enough districts will shift in the 2012-13 school year that, that we will, we, we could look, look back, you know, in a, in a, a decade or two and, and think of that period of time as, as the pivot point when education shifted from print to digital, from, from age cohorts of kids with about the same birthday to, to personalized uh, digital learning. One of the big drivers is the common core and that the, the fact that states are adopting common uh, standards and that uh, most of the states are working together in a consortia to build a new set of assessments, many of which are, are online. I think what that means, if you're a state policymaker, you have to get ready to administer uh, online assessments. I think we've also passed the point in time where it doesn't make sense to buy a textbook. It, it, you, you, you can now give every student uh, an, an internet access device and do it less expensively uh, than, than you could uh, to, to buy textbooks. So we've reached these tipping point moments where state leaders need to think about the pivot to digital. And uh, tomorrow we have a, a very exciting announcement. Uh, uh, the Foundation for Excellence in Education has been, been the project sponsor of the what was the Digital Learning uh, Council, and tomorrow will become Digital Learning Now, a, 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 an advocacy effort to help guide that uh, pivot point. So this is a, a, an important topic at a very important time, and we have uh, the right people uh, to, to give us some perspective on it. Uh, so first of all, I, I want to introduce my friend Michael Horn. Michael is one of the co-authors of Disrupting Class. I think it was the, the most important uh, education book of the last decade, and he uh, just released a second edition. It's available for purchase on the, on the book uh, table outside. And uh, Michael, I'll just ask you, uh, how's it panning out. You, you started thinking about this a couple years ago and you just had a chance to sort of revise your thinking and is it disrupting the way you thought? Thanks, Tom. Uh, it, it, first of all, it's good to be here. And as Tom said, this is a great audience, maybe even smarter than the panelists up here. But uh, what I, you know, when you, when you look back, Tom, at some of the projections we made in the book, a lot of the focus was around uh, this growth of this disruptive innovation broadly called uh, online or digital learning. Um, and we made this crazy at the time projection in the first edition that uh, by the year 2019, 50% of all high school courses, all courses would be delivered in some form or fashion online, uh, that the platform for that experience would shift. And at the time, uh, for the first six months that the book came out, Everyone said, you guys are just nuts. You guys are way too aggressive with that projection. And then something flipped about six months in. And everyone still said we were absolutely nuts and totally crazy. But now it was for a different reason. They said we were too conservative on that same projection. And I, I think what happened, I, I sort of plead the fifth on it. I, I think the projection will be roughly correct within you know, plus or minus three years on either side. And it's funny that your date in that uh, a terrific blog that you wrote uh, August uh, 2012, uh, roughly coincides to when our flip on that S-curve uh, happens toward that adoption. Um, I, th I think what you're seeing is part of it is that indeed online learning, online courses, full-time enrollments in virtual schools, hybrid learning models, 
blended learning models um, are becoming more ubiquitous in every single district out of necessity uh, because of budget pressures and so forth uh, that are forcing people to look at new models and, and, and that's starting to raise the public consciousness around, oh wait, this is actually happening. And the financial crisis that we did not foresee when we wrote the book obviously pushed it way more in people's minds. So that is a big, uh, you know, that's a bit of a shift, but, but it's in line, I think, with the general thinking. The thing I think that we maybe uh, didn't quite get right in the first edition that I hope we've changed a little bit in the second edition um, is that we implied that just because digital learning, just because online learning were to grow to meet this, that it would result in personalized learning as well in this student-centric system and a transformation from a monolithic system built on factory model inputs and so forth into a student-centric system. And I'm, I, I guess I'm decidedly more cautious on that now than I was when, I, when, we, when the book came out uh, because it really is the role of policy to make, put the right incentives in place to, to make this a demand-driven innovation toward quality for each and every single child. Uh, and if, the, if that part of the market is screwed up, you're going to incentivize products that maybe will come back in 10 years from now and yes, we'll have hit that 50% threshold, but we won't have really transformed the system. We'll have layered it on just to sustain what the system currently does. Uh, and while I see uh, lots of reasons for optimism, uh, there's some real notable improvements in some of the uh, curriculum out there, some of the assessments. Uh, some of the programs, there's full video game based courses that the Florida Virtual School brings to the table. Uh, there's still a lot of policies that focus around seed time. They don't tie funding to mastery uh, and, and things of that nature that I think really hold us back and keep us locked into this uh, current system. There, uh, before we continue, there's another six or seven seats up here. So if you, if you want a seat, you're welcome to wander up here while we're transitioning. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a man who needs no introduction at this conference, but a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Joel Klein, for nearly a decade has been the best system head in America, and he has become, uh, I believe, the most important ec equity and excellence uh, advocate in education uh, in America as well, and I, I appreciate his contribution in both regards deeply. Uh, on this subject, I appreciate the, the fact that, that New York City um, became uh, an innovation hub that is important around the world. The, the fact that Joel created room for um, some extraordinary advances uh, to occur is important, not just for New York City, but, uh, but for this country. Um, so, Joel, we'd love to know more about uh, maybe, maybe the inspiration for, for those innovations in, in New York City, and then everybody's here is, is dying to know more about what, uh, what's next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. If I knew you were going to give me that kind of introduction, I would have resigned a long time ago. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Michael, thank you. The book that Michael and Clay wrote is really, it's, it's a very important uh, book. But I want to start with the note that Michael ended on and talk about some of what we're doing in uh, New York and, and indeed some of what I hope to do in the future is the resistance. You know, the last panel struck me, people kept like a tongue to a sore tooth coming back to this point about, you know, can we reconfigure the existing model to make it somewhat better rather than disrupt and change the existing model? And one of the things I'm convinced of is that the defenders of the status quo are not going to go away because we have a conference here in Washington, D.C. The status quo serves an enormous number of needs very, very well. If you think a structure of lockstep pay, life tenure, job security, and long-term pension and health benefits is a bad structure, you haven't been out there in the real world very recently. And so, same kind of thing when you talk about what, what seat time. I, I mean, this thing with seat time is the most dazzlingly dumb thing I have ever seen, but it's a fundamental feather bedding provision. What, what is seat time? Seat time means you can't get credit unless you have a teacher in front of you. Now, you can go online. So I, I've been doing this for years. I create a lot of small high schools with the support of Tom Vanderock when he was at the Gates Foundation. And 
we opened up probably 200 of these things getting by independent research really much better results. But sometimes you have three, four kids who want to take an AP course, which Michael and Clay wrote about, and we can't afford a teacher. There are great online courses they could take, and if they pass the AP class, they get college credit. So we have a seat time requirement. I go to Albany and ask them to waive it every year. And they tell me, no, no, we, say, we don't do it that way. I say, I know, that's why I came up to ask you to waive it. Because, <laughs> because I, I get it. So, but you can, now it's almost breathtaking when you say the next second, look, if the kid gets a four or a five, he's gonna get college credit on it. So why shouldn't we let her take it? And if she gets a four or five, give her high school credit. And you know, the amazing thing is consistency is a hobgoblin of small minds. These people say, that's not the way we do it here in New York. Now, so those issues are gonna become issues and the question really for all of us who are trying to inject disruptive strategies is how we navigate the politics having said that of all the issues that i've worked on this is the one where i, I think we're getting real traction so we've got this and in part in no small measure because teachers really like it and they find it empowering to them so when we did a thing called the school of one which is fundamentally a multiple modality focus on the individual child so that the kid can use different platforms, different groups, different experiences, and we clock it each day and see how much progress she makes, how much progress he makes, et cetera, and which modalities work best, whether it's an online tutor or whether it's an online course or whether it's a platform that we have and there are various learning platforms that we're using. And we're getting very, very data rich information. And so instead of thinking about one teacher trying to like conduct an orchestra of 30 kids and figure out where the middle or sweet spot is and hope you don't lose too many on either end, we're able to individuate for each kid, move him or her at his or her own pace. And some of our kids are doing a lot more than a year's work of learning in one year. Others are struggling to do it, but we're not holding the class at the middle level in order to uh, make sure that this particular struggling learner doesn't catch up. And we're also finding out for this particular struggling learner which way she learns best. So, you know, we've got these great, incredible games to be master or mistress of the universe. You've got to solve increasingly hard quadratic equations. And for some of the kids, this is really working very well, et cetera, et cetera. And so we've kind of encapsulated all of this in an innovation zone. And unlike Tom and, and Mike, I'm, I'm not smart enough, I don't know exactly when this whole thing is gonna tip. What I do know is after eight and a half years, to be in an environment where innovation is rejected because you can't guarantee the results of innovation and it's so forth, you shouldn't take a risk with our kids. Nobody realizes the risk we're currently taking with our kids, which is condemning them to a no, We are condemning them to failure. I mean, right now in America today, we're still massively undereducating our kids. So if we're not prepared to do things differently, then I think we're, we're, we're gonna continue on this path. And if we think we can rejigger a few of these pieces or negotiate a slightly better un union contract, then that's gonna fix all our ills. We're missing the big boat here. So to me, you know, this whole notion that Clay talks about, Michael talks about in terms of disrupting class has gotta be front and center in, in a, an entirely new, different paradigm of learning. Last thing for a note of optimism in all of this, I hate to say it, but I think the current budget structure, the elimination of the federal dollars that we used to get on, on uh, which Mort and others talked about that we got under the stimulus package, I mean, a city like mine, that's a billion dollars a year. I think that's gonna force us to think very differently about this service delivery challenge. And if I could wish one thing on New York or any other city is move away from an assembly mo line model to one that stimulates and revor rewards innovation. I don't know how people go to work every day and think there's gonna be nothing but sameness in their lives. And then they say to themselves, you know, you can see them say this. They say, well, I'm only 14 and a half years away from my retirement. The <laughs> best day in many of my people's lives is the day they retire. And to be part of a workforce that believes that is so stultifying. So all of these opportunities and technology can unleash it, but it's really a question of can, can we create a culture of innovation to replace a culture of stultification? And I'm not sure which of the particular strategies will be most effective over time. What I am sure is we can do a hell, whole hell of a lot better if we start to move in the directions that people like Michael and others are talking about.
So what's this News Corp thing about? <laughs> the News Corp thing is to see if we can move into this space. I believe it's going to take private capital. I mean, having done this inside the school district, you know, you're scraping together philanthropic dollars to do the school of one and so forth. But I don't think it, without the flow of real private capital into this space right. that we're going to be able. So, you know, looking at different kinds of strategies, platforms, but thinking, look, any intelligent person would think in the following sort of way. How would you try to deliver the best education to your children? And for people who don't think that there's online value, or one of my favorites, a recent university professor told me, he said, I get what you're doing. I said, how did you figure it out? Because he seemed very resistant. And he said to me, well, I did a survey of 20 people at my college. And I asked him, would you rather take uh, Michael Sandel's online course on justice? If you haven't seen it, it's spectacular. Or would you rather have it taught by one of the professors here? All 20 said they'd rather go online and take Mandel's uh, uh, course. So, uh, um, so, so he says to me, so it's clear to me, why am I paying all of these professors a whole lot cheaper to do it the other way, right? And I said, think of this, you know, you're the president of a major university. Can you imagine how it looks from where I sit when I'm trying to figure out how to get 8,000 math teachers to an entirely different level when in fact I can have those math teachers working off of different platforms and strategies that will empower them. And when you see my teachers, they love it. The thought that they don't have to design a lesson or four lessons every day, but can actually build off of the lesson that others have designed is such an empowering thing. So that's why I'm optimistic about this, and that's why I'm hoping that we can move in the private markets to generate a market that actually disrupts the current textbook-based model. Thanks, Joel. Uh, I, I think, Joel, uh, going to News Corp and, and buying uh, wireless is the beginning of the party, the beginning of uh, next-gen learning platform. Uh, we were having a, a conversation up here right before the, the panel started that uh, I, I think we have a super-saturated solution. And, and in the next year, you'll see a number of combinatorials where you have a, several big mashups that create an ecosystem around which several hundred million dollars can be invested to create next-gen platforms. Uh, digital content libraries, social learning layer, uh, data warehouse, uh, student learning profiles, smart recommendation engines, and, and a set of aligned services for uh, students, uh, teachers, and schools. Those ecosystems are going to emerge rather rapidly, and if you're interested in this space, I would keep an eye on what he does. Just don't um, give him all the trade secrets so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the exciting, the exciting it, it's an exciting time for a lot of reasons. And uh, we're seeing some, some very cool um, local initiatives. And, and uh, Terry Sander is, uh, is, is here to talk about one in, in California. Uh, Terry's at the uh, Imperial County. Uh, where they've launched a, a statewide high-speed network initiative uh, that is a lot, well, is a lot more than uh, broadband, with a, a new set of apps on a high-speed network that is uh, a pretty exciting project. So, Thank you. Terry. On behalf of the California Department of Education, our office, which is Imperial County Office of Education, a regional support office, uh, facilitates how schools and districts connect to the California Research and Education Network, which also serves the UC system, the CSU system, and, and the community college system in California. And once, uh, w w we can't have people standing in, in legislative hearings and asking, well, what did the technology investment get us? Did it get classroom improvement? So when the legislature um, acted to uh, codify the program that was an effective way of providing just the connectivity up and down the state, we have. 86% of school districts and 81% of schools connected to the K-12 high-speed network. Um, it, the, the mission became to leverage that connectivity and make the resources available on the network that schools and districts can access as they choose to. And um, th thankful, there was, a, there was an argument about whether content belonged as part of our mission, but the, le the legislature said, um, we're not actually gonna fund that but we'll leave, it, we'll leave it down here as the fourth point of the work you should accomplish. And so we, we did try to leverage. We, we talked to other county offices of education and said, we know you are developing support systems that are curricular-based, and we would like you to put them on the network and share them here. 
one of our goals was to develop, well, buy or build a universal repository where we could put great content in once and have it deployed many times, many ways, and for many purposes for the 1,000 school districts and 10,000 schools in California. And um, we hadn't quite gotten to the point where we had, our, our, we have very gifted developers. They were busy on other things. And we had a, an organization from Ohio come through our door last um, April or May, um, IQ Innovations from Ohio, with 10 years history of doing the online deployment of courseware for ECOT. And they said, we'd like to be your partners. And we said, that's a partnership that we think will help schools and districts in California. So as, um, as their partnerships build with other content purveyors, they have, they have a digital marketplace that is available to all schools and districts in California. It is branded as Calacuity in our state. And we have um, courseware available. We have free re resources available. And the, the benefit to our teachers is that whether your district says we want to do this as a district or whether you don't have that district support but you personally want to use the learning management system that comes along with the program, you have access to it. And so um, as at the, the fiscal crisis that we're in is putting uh, offices under pressure about they, they bought ANGEL <coughs> as an alternative to a more expensive system and the uh, fiscal advantage to buying that less expensive system is going to time out because uh, mer mergers in that industry. We have a, a free learning management system that we're able to offer because of the partnership with IQ Innovations and the, the Calacuity learning management system and courseware that's provided in there, um, Curium courseware, um, their <coughs> partnerships with PowerSpeak and E2020. There is a foundation in California that is um, been developing the, the digital textbooks, CK12, and CK12 has been interested in and, and agreed to also put those digital textbooks in this learning management system. So the teacher, as um, Mr. Klein was referencing, can build the course and, and never leave the site, but, but use free resources from Verizon Thinkfinity, use, use paid for resources that come from um, the Curium content or some of the other <coughs> vendors that are available through uh, the Calacuity location and build their courses that, that will make their lives easier. Uh, our teachers, um, the, that the debate we heard at, during lunch, uh, are we gonna let teacher unions keep us from innovating? Uh, the, the teachers want to innovate and where the choices choices boil down not just at a, a state level, at state policymaker level, but also down to district level, school principal level, and teacher level, and they've got the opportunity to access um, tools that make their work easier. They want to customize teaching for their students. They want to make learning uh, up to date enough that their 21st century learners are gonna stay tuned in when they come into their classes. So we just are real pleased with the opportunity we have to make it available, and, and it is a choice. There's no, there's no force here, there's no push down from um, th the state level, for sure. It's just uh, other choices that are available for the, the districts, schools, and, and teachers to take advantage of. Thanks, Terry. Uh, uh, there, uh, we're gonna start taking your questions and comments, so if you wanna jump up and in, the, in the queue, please do. I, I wanna make two quick um, sort of closing comments to wrap those. Uh, the, the first of all, uh, what th these two comments are the answer to the question, why is this different now, right? We've been doing this ed tech thing for 20 years, so like, why is it different now? First one is new business models. So Terry talked about IQity, which is a, a, an, an example of a freemium uh, business model. So we're, what we're seeing in, in Web2 commerce are um, free core applications that go viral and then on, on top of that, the ability to monetize that platform with a set of premium services. So IQity is a, is a free LMS monetized by premium content. Spiral Universe is a free SIS. Um, two investments in, in my revolution learning portfolio, Edmodo is a free social network. Um, Manga High is a free uh, set of uh, very cool middle, middle grade ga uh, math games. 
These are all new business models. It's a new doorway into the classroom where, where innovative teachers can find these free apps and adopt them very quickly. And, and companies now have an alternative to the district slog of, of selling to school districts. And lots of companies have died on that, on that uh, pathway. So num number one, new business models are, are very interesting. Uh, and, and Joel uh, and News Corp bought Wireless. Wireless has uh, freereading.net, which is a, another great example of a, a free core app with a set of services around it. So business models are different. The second thing that's different is scalable capability. Think about this thought experiment. The people in this room, K-12, Connections Academy, Florida Virtual Academy, and others, could fulfill this promise. If, if Secretary Duncan said, second semester, every kid in America should have access to every AP course, every high-level STEM course, and every foreign language course, we could provision that logistically and technologically. The only problem would be politically, right? State and district politics are the only thing that would stand in the way of making that promise to every student in America. Think about that. We can do that. We, we have the... We have the organizations, we have the technology to l deliver very high quality education today. And the only thing that's standing in the way is us, right? And that's why we're having this conference today to see if we can uh, find ways to, to bring down the barriers to let innovation uh, Im improve education for all kids. Now to you, please. Uh, my name is Rolf McAllister from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And uh, we've heard about innovation in education, and I'm sure where you are, you all see a lot of people, people maybe who call on you, or you've come across entrepreneurs that have now gotten into education. In the last year, what has been the most exciting uh, product, project, uh, that an entrepreneur you've seen either has finished developing or maybe is in the midst of developing that is going to uh, impact uh, the classroom and, uh, and students? Tom just mentioned a few of them. Um, Edmodo and Manga High, of course. Uh, no, no, I mean, in seriousness, those are really interesting models that are out there right now. Um, I'm impressed with a company in New York City called Newton uh, that, that really intrigues me quite a bit. Its counterpart in the Bay Area where I live uh, is called Grocket uh, that I find really intriguing. Uh, they're starting to uh, look at these adaptive learning platforms that really understand how a student is learning, pulling the right resources for what that student needs next. Uh, Grocket uh, is looking at a lot of social learning and stuff like that uh, in terms of communities, of uh, groups of students uh, for test prep is the market that they've both chosen. But they're starting to look at the K-12 space increasingly. Uh, and I think some of those organizations and those companies are the most intriguing as we go further out uh, in, in this realm. What I really look for, and, and Tom and I have a back and forth on this all the time over email, is trying to find those platforms that will really enable this to just take off, to really personalize uh, for each individual uh, child. And so it's the platform that I find the most intriguing. And I think the apps on either side of it will help drive adoption of it. But the platform itself is going to be the most interesting thing. And I guess I, I just want to, since I have the mic for a second, just want to cap one point that Tom said, which is a really important one which is for the first time we can bypass the district textbook adoption processes, you said. And it's a really important point because the district textbook adoption processes have basically mandated one-size-fits-all products into the system. So for, if we're now allowed to bypass them, all of a sudden this long tail of learning, this customized products and so forth can really flourish. And so this is a really important point uh, that Tom highlighted there. Joel? Um, I'm just going to throw out allowing kids to use their own devices in the classroom and do auto responding using Twitter so that the teacher's getting current real time assessment of whether the kids got the concept because they tweeted whether they got the concept or not. And that in that, in that narrow place, uh, people weren't locking down what the kids have access to. And if Twitter's scary for you, use Edmodo, E-D-M-O-D-O dot com. <laughs> <laughs> Joke. So, I, Joke I, I, again, I, I'm not smart enough to know, you know, there's so much now that it's in the early stages. From what I see from where I've sat in New York, there's a couple of things that I think uh, are, are at least have me excited. One, one is this whole school of one approach, yeah. 
which is, is very powerful, and I, I suppose it's because uh, all my life I, I wanted to have my own algorithm, and now I finally have one, so <laughs> I'm, I'm very excited about it. But it's, it's really, it's very powerful. If you haven't seen it, you come to New York, I, I really, you know, reckon, because it's, it's, it's a, it, when you see it and visualize what's going on for the individual child and the amount of information and data we're developing on the platform is so, critical to this. And, and then, you know, then the, the whole question of content, which works better, which are, one of the great things, and, and you can understand why people don't like this, is if I've got six different kind of lessons online on how you uh, do the circumference of a circle, I can tell in relatively short order which one of those is working better for kids, which one isn't working better for kids. So, you know, you can start to disaggregate this data in lots of different ways, individual to the child, to the substance, to the teacher, whatever you're trying to do. But it's really a reconceptualization. The second thing that I just, and I, I may be proven wrong about this, but I've been struck by, there's a group called Time to Know, it's an Israeli group, and they have a learning platform that they've developed for math and English language arts. They developed it in Israel. We're piloting it in about 20 schools. And what you see is these are very sophisticated lessons developed by brilliant mathematicians who know how to teach. And the graphics are certainly much more powerful than anything that our, uh, we could produce uh, in, inside 8,000 math classes in New York. And what I'm seeing, two things, is the engagement of the students is way higher. I mean, if you spend time in classrooms, you watch kids, and this is way higher. They're online, but it's, it's very directed to them. And second of all, the teacher has got much, much more information now so that she can figure out how to differentiate. And I, I think there's real promise in that. What I'm most excited about are folks like uh, Joel and News Corp joining the investor ranks. The, n the number of people in the United States and now internationally investing gotcha. in learning innovation has, it's grown by an order of magnitude since I started Revolution Learning like two years ago. So the party started and, and uh, I think we're on a, the early stage of, a, of an explosion of uh, very exciting learning tools that are gonna change the world. So, Linda? Um, Linda Leach from the Education Fund in Miami. Um, I'm not a, um, against technology. I have my undergraduate degree in computer science, and one of our first programs uh, was to put 10,000 computers in the homes of low-income children and use software to improve, improve their reading, um, which we did. But what I am afraid of, and I, I would like a response, is um, I see that the elected officials might grab on to the aspect of technology and say, okay, well, we don't need a teacher in the classroom. We can use technology. We can just put a teacher up on the screen. We can just have them on the computer. And what I see from so many students, and New York's a great school when they went, great uh, example, you went to the small schools because it's personalized. There's a personal relationship. How do we make sure we don't lose those personal relationships? Uh, Good question. I, I do think that fundamentally the introduction of technology, it's not going to eliminate teachers. Uh, it will change their role in some significant ways. Joel already alluded to them. Much more than what right now they sit in, at the chalkboard. Actually, let me take it from a different stance. Do you know the Khan Academy? How many in the room know the uh, Khan Academy? Okay. I encourage you to Google this. K-H-A-N. Yeah. A uh, guy named Sal Khan who's created thousands of uh, video lessons of, of math and now science on the web to teach concepts. And he has this great talk at the GEL 2010 conference where he talks about how uh, some of the sacred cows of what we think of as great teaching in, in, in classrooms right now. And one of them he says, you know, right now when the teacher turns the back to the child and is writing on the blackboard, it's not incredibly personal learning as it is right now. Clay Christensen likes to joke, anytime someone's beyond the first couple rows of a uh, classroom, it's already been distance learning. <laughs> now, there's, there, there's some truth to that. And so what I think that the technology is going to enable is that for the first time, the, the teacher's role is really going to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with children, become a mentor, a motivator, able to facilitate small groups to come together and actually work together in social groups, whether they are in the same place or, gosh, if policy permits it, in different countries even. Um, and you might even have differentiation of teacher roles. 
I think if we decide what we want the outcomes to be, which is why the policy conversation is really important and the work that the Digital Learning Council, now Digital Learning Now, uh, is doing is so vital, is that if we understand what outcomes we want to see and we tie funding to that, and we free up the inputs so that innovators can get there the way they want to get there, human capital is going to be a part of this, but the creative ways in which it gets used and the ways in which it redefines our imagination of what it might be is truly going to be different. And the one thing we hear consistently from teachers in online learning environments and the like is I get to know my students better than I did in the traditional classroom. So I don't think that, as long as we have the outcomes right and we are rigid on that and hold these people to a high standard that innovate in the space, it's not, it's not something that I personally uh, worry a lot about. I, mean, I, I think it's a question that we should be attentive to, but I, I think we should neither glamorize the status quo in that regard, that is what Martin Buber calls the I-thou contact or the I-thou equation is very uneven in K-12 education. You know, I have student advisory committees and I talk to them about this all the time. Second of all, it seems what Michael says is right to me. We need to think about what is the best way to get the pieces we need for the outcomes we want. And one of the things that you're seeing more of is the role of the teacher can be more of, a, of an advisor, a differentiator, in, in some schools even a Sherpa to help children navigate the different things. And in that respect, this may make the value of the human contact greater than it currently is. So nobody thinks we ought to just lock kids away for 12 or 13 years with a machine and at the end check out whether they've done all right or not. I mean, but, but how we create the mix of things that we're trying to provide in an education, I think can be thought of very differently. And, and again, it strikes me as I don't see why if you can get you know, the great lecture, I always said this to people, when, when I was interested in physics, I had a lot of great physics teachers, but I gotta tell you, nobody teaches physics like Richard Feynman. And the fact that he's not in the front row of my, uh, teaching from the front row of my high school doesn't mean I shouldn't have watched his lectures at Caltech, because there was nothing that stimulated my interest the way he stimulated my interest. And that seems to me to be the magic in this thing, but you can't eliminate what you're calling personalization from the schools, that doesn't mean we can't do that differently and better. Thank you. Go, if you haven't uh, visited School of One, go visit and watch those teachers and tell me that's not a better teaching experience and a better learning experience. Um, that's the, the, the force multiplier that several people have talked about this morning, making teachers um, better with, with better information so that they can teach more effectively often to smaller groups of kids. Just to underscore that though, Tom, if you ask the teacher, it's interesting, because at first the teachers are, you know, we, we had volunteer teachers, but then we, as we expanded it, and the teachers are skeptical, because they too have in mind, you know, one teacher and as few kids as possible in a class. That's the paradigm they grew up in. Now, those teachers who are working in, in this overwhelmingly, we do surveys on this all the time, overwhelmingly excited. They think they're being made better at what they're doing, which is a critical thing in how you move a system forward. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Wayne Humphrey, the Vice President of the Central Florida YMCA. And um, we have a vested interest in education. We feel that we're the natural partner to the school districts. I'd like to uh, direct my question to Chancellor Klein. I believe you have the largest school district in America, over a million children. And the hue and cry of industry, both nonprofit and for profit, is that when youngsters are coming out of school, whether it's high school, community college, college, graduate school, they're looking for some specific outcomes. Are they critical thinkers? Are they critical writers? Are they critical readers and computers? And as we develop taxpayers for the American economy and ultimately the global economy, with that one million students in New York City, what are your best systems that are in place now that have a youngster coming into industry that can write a letter a report that has subject, verb, and object um, that speaks 
the king's English, critical speaking. What are the systems that are on it? And I, I suspect, and I'm a lover of technology, I suspect that maybe picking up the pen or the pencil and putting it on paper and writing may be something that we might want to reevaluate. Yeah, and I, I, out of your experience, what are the concrete outcomes that your million students are going to have to produce those kind of skills? So it's a, let me say two things. First, first of all, it's, I don't think technology is some kind of panacea. I, okay. I think what the question we're trying to figure out, what you're asking me is how do we successfully educate children for the, what the 21st century is going to demand of right. them. If you haven't read it, best book I've read in the last five years other than Michael's book is a book by two Harvard economists, uh, Claudia Goldman and Lawrence Katz, called The Race Between Education and Technology. Yes. And unfortunately for our children, they're going to grow up in a global economy in which the skills demanded of them are going to be very different from the skills demanded of us. So all you're asking me is how do you make sure a child gets a great education so that she can be prepared for what the market is going to demand. It seems to me there's a couple of things. I mean, how you, the quality of the instruction matters. And the question of whether technology, not, not because it's a computer, I don't care about that, right. but whether there are ways to strengthen the quality of instruction. And my example, for example, for me, when I was watching Richard Feynman, I think he made me a more critical thinker than somebody else who would have taught me physics. And I think we can do that in a multitude of ways. So just because there's not a teacher in front of the classroom doesn't mean that you can't have written assignments or that children can't learn to write better than they're learning right now. And second of all, I'm a big believer, while it's true that basics are not enough, I don't know critical thinkers who don't master the basics. I'm a little tired of this notion that, you know, we should say it doesn't matter what the kid scores on a reading exam. If she can't read a paragraph and figure out what it means, it can be very hard to be a higher order thinker. People who don't understand algebra and can't right. answer algebraic questions, even if it's on a bubble form, those are not likely to be people that are going to be higher order thinking. Now, we should test writing skills. We can do group work that we now evaluate collectively together in a school of one. But the question you're asking me is, what does it mean when a child graduates from high school in terms of that she or he has been well-educated? And the answer to that is to teach the, precisely this kind of skills and the kind of knowledge that you're talking about. And what's not happening in America today is that we're not doing that, period, end of case, for many kids. That's why this discussion is so imperative. Thank you. Tom, before. Can, can I make one quick point? Because Joel said something that I think is an interesting point, which is that technology is not the panacea. Um, and I, th I think that's true in the sense that it's, it's maybe a conduit to a new system. It's not about layering technology onto our current flawed factory model system, which is not going to work. It's about changing and transforming the system itself to move away from this input focus to these outcome focus and so forth. And one of the great things, if you look at the School of One and you look at their presentations and so forth, and one of the things that drives me nuts about saying, well, we just put technology into this classroom and then boom, is that what they did was, let's, what if we stripped down the walls between the classrooms? Right. And we rethought what the teaching model looked like and what our assumptions were of how many teachers to how many students and all these things and how these all interact with each other. To me, that's the fresh thinking that's really needed because it's about the system at the end of the day. We, we are working in a flawed system. It's not bad people. They're in a bad system. Let, let, let me jump on that one, one more time. Maybe it is beating the horse to death here. But a, it always struck me, think about this. We've got for, I don't know, any other district. In New York, when I came here, they had these things called computer labs. So like, like we were teaching these kids how to use a computer. OK, but the notion that the computer can be a way to empower, you can write an essay on a computer. And you can actually transmit it to the teacher, and she can read it and give you critical feedback right there. The idea that the computer can be a means to improve instruction is what interests me. My kids know how to use a computer in the 21st century. So this weird thing we have called a laboratory, in which we put, a, put them in there and tell them, like, this is a computer, sort of like it's a microscope or something like that, is so goofy to me. So, well, so now you got me started. I, I actually think it is a panacea. 
Um, I, I think right in front of us is a historic opportunity to change the learning curve. We can build tools in schools today that where kids learn more, faster, cheaper in America. We have the first opportunity in history to reach hundreds of millions of students around the world with very high quality secondary education in, in blended schools. And that, that can be done for easily for less than $100 a year. We can reach hundreds of millions of kids. You think about the aggregate level of prosperity that we can add uh, to the planet by educating a billion young people better than we do today. And if that's not a panacea, I don't know what is. Uh, so it's not giving them, it's, 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 it's the way we instruct children that you're talking about, and their technology can change the game. That I yeah, completely it, it's believe a, in. It, it's a productivity changing, a curve changing yeah. tool, yeah. right? For, for the first time, kids are gonna be able to learn more faster, and they'll be able to do it for less money. That, I think it's a big deal. Okay. Tom, I, I, I totally agree as well, except for one thing, which is that, again, the system has to make some changes to take advantage of that. T lots of them, and, right? And, right, right? And so this, I mean, we, just, we've looked we've at, layered on top we've of layered on top and seen almost no changes except a lot more money. And so right. part of the problem is, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of providers in this room right now that for 100 bucks, for one, they can offer all the courses available for one right. student and right. boom. Uh, the problem is then when you look at the actual districts and how they implement it, one case study we're looking at, you say they have a dropout recovery program right. on online curriculum. It's exciting as anything. You say, how many students did you graduate last year? They say, we graduated 100. So that sounds good. How many did you serve? 80. Think about that for one second. They graduated 100 students and served 80. So they had a 125% success rate? No, 80 was just the number of students they served on the count day. They have no idea how many they served over the course of the year. These data systems, these policies are totally antiquated, and that's right. a problem. Back to you. My name is Mayor Katz. I'm an attorney for the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, which is a nonprofit organization that does a lot of school choice work. Um, a lot of the attention in electronic education and technology is in the context of public schools, public education, or in the charter model, which is obviously right. also public. Uh, I'm curious to hear your comments on the ability to market these products um, in an economically efficient manner to private schools without sacrificing yeah. their pedagogy and their specific interests? No, it, it's, uh, this is gonna be enormously important for private schools. It, it, I mean, we're, we're starting to see very good, low-cost private schools, uh, some religious, some that are not, um, but it, it, it could be what saves urban Catholic education, uh, these, these lower-cost uh, blended models. So I, I think it'll be enormously important. Um, you know, there's no reason, I don't know if, are, can private schools use your network? Absolutely. Uh, all schools in California, um, it, you, you must serve at least five children as a private school in California to get on the service. But whether you are connected to the, the network or not, uh, all the resources available, and that includes video conferencing but, and I mean, that, that's prep a, courses. That's, that's huge. I mean, this is a, this is a good LMS with, with good content. It's all free. It's, it, I, that's, a, that's a game changer. Uh, if you're if you're operating a, a private school, mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's the the same is going to be true um, internationally. Very low cost private schools are changing the landscape in India and Africa, and will in other countries as well. Do, do you see this being available in the United States in the short term? Sure, uh, it is. I mean, it is now. It's available in California. Uh, it, so. The, 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 the OER, the open content, open education resources that are available, hippocampus.org, if you haven't looked at that, it's a free high school math and science curriculum. It's very good. It's what I'm gonna use to open uh, a handful of charter schools next year. Um, uh, the Gates Foundation and Hewlett Foundation have funded a next gen uh, set of, of math uh, courses, developmental math sequence. Very exciting, and they actually incorporate Khan Academy. So, Mm -hmm. Little teacher videos plus Khan Academy, uh, you know, and this stuff is all free. It, so it, there's no excuse for, for not using it. Didn't you say that Khan Academy is going to be the hippocampus? Hippocampus.org. Hippocampus. Yeah, the private, uh, private National schools. National Repository of Open Content. Yeah, no, the private schools are going to be a huge uh, game changer, I think, in this is it's going to open access to a lot more students also to that option. 
make it a lot more affordable. And if you want to see an evidence of how it might roll out, just look at the turmoil in the higher education space right. with a lot of institutions being disrupted there by low-cost uh, providers coming in uh, who actually charge similar tuition, but the margin on it is so right. much higher because of what they can do with the technology. I mean, we, we passed the point in time a couple years ago where anyone can learn anything anywhere for free or cheap. Uh, and a lot of people in higher ed haven't figured out that the game has changed. And a lot of third-tier colleges are going to go out of business in, uh, in the next decade because uh, you, you can get a very good education. Uh, I was on the founding board of Western Governors University. It's a great competency-based university. Kids earn credit at twice the normal rate. Uh, they can do it for about 5,800 bucks a year. You, you, can go, you can go to school for $99 a month and, uh, and earn college. Uh, you, most of your, or all of your, your, uh, your college credit. So uh, it, it's changing the landscape fast. Yes. Hi, Glenn Grunhagen. I'm a state rep from uh, Minnesota. I've also been a school, public school board member for the last 15 years. Uh, my a little closer to the microphone. Oh, okay. My question has to do with primarily K through 8. I, uh, I tend to see in the K-8 area that technology is a tool of assist, assistance but not a replacement for the teacher or uh, necessarily the Carnegie unit. And what I mean by that, and I've had this conversation numerous times, I'm a strong supporter of rote learning and memorization, practice makes perfect, and the paper and pencil uh, practices. And I, you know, the response I usually get in education is, what good does it do, Glenn, for, ch for students to memorize information, spit it out on a test, and then forget about it you know, a day or two later? And I used to wonder, yeah, why, what good does that do? And then I read a paper by an educator who, who brought out the fact that what you're doing is developing a habit and a human characteristic of being able to take information in accurately, processing it mentally, and putting it out accurately. That is an extremely important characteristic to develop. It's what our employers complain that they're not, that our students are, aren't able to do. And rote learning and memorization has been systematically, systematically eliminated from our public educational system over the last 30 years. We need to go back to that model, build that foundation on that K through eight, and then give them the flexibility of choices at the high school or college level with more technology. Just respond to those comments, thank so you. The, you know, what we've learned a lot about in the last 15 years is, uh, is, is rote memorization and skill development, it's in casual games. That, that's the most persistent, that's the, We've seen this explosion of uh, perseverant behavior in, in the casual game space, and people are starting to take advantage of that. Um, that's, that's why John Danner has, it, at Rocket Ship, has his kids spend 25% of their time in a learning lab, because he, he knows it's the most efficient and effective way to build basic skills. And then he can have teachers focus on critical thinking, writing, and speaking in, in, uh, during his classroom time. So I, I agree with you, but it's all going to happen uh, on a, in a computer-based learning environment where where we, we, can, we can double or triple the amount of time on basic skills for most kids uh, and, and do it better and cheaper than we do it today. That's probably not what you want to hear, but that's where I think it's headed. There, there's a program called uh, Tune Into Reading out of Florida, um, or it's a company based in Florida. Um, they developed a, a software originally called Singing Coach, uh, which uh, basically was just a, a sort of an American Idol-like uh, thing where kids would sing into a, a stupid piece of software and get a grade based on how many notes they hit right and did they pronounce the lyrics correct and stuff like that. And one day they got a phone call from a uh, uh, principal, um, or excuse me, uh, they got a call from a parent and said, we think your program helps, uh, is helping our ch child read better. I said, well, that's not possible. We didn't design it to do that. I said, no, 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 we think it does because the teacher called us the other day and said that our child's reading scores has jumped dramatically. What are you doing differently at home? And we're doing nothing. They're just playing this stupid program. <laughs> and it turns out that by it basically tricks kids into getting the necessary repetitions that they need to have. That, so on certain interventions, you need a child to sit there literally 25 times to get through something. Right. Good luck finding a human who wants to do that. Right. So, seriously. I mean, teachers, there's a lot of things going on in a classroom. They're really motivated to engage with this. Right. I, this is going. I totally agree with what if Tom you, said. If you want to, if you want to build automaticity around fractions, look at Flower Power on Manga High. Honest to God, kids will spend hours 
uh, doing fractions, and it will become uh, automatic. Uh, it, it's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of flashcard apps that are out on the web now that are another fantastic way to build, um, build automaticity around basic skills. I'd rather have teachers spending time on on uh, on, on big questions, uh, but I hear you. Do you want to add anything to that, Terry? But, yes, sir. Hi, Gary Stanislavski, State Center in Oklahoma. Nice to see you again, Michael. Just completed a uh, task force on virtual learning in Oklahoma. Uh, Michael is gracious enough to come, and and for those that don't know, he's been married about a month now, <laughs> so uh, still a very newlywed. Um, the question we're struggling with is we're, is we're really drafting policy. Last year, I ran a bill, and, and for online learners, got rid of the Carnegie unit, replaced it with a, uh, the notion of mastery of you know, material, competency. But in terms of actually defining the policy, writing that down, what does it mean, mastery material? How have you done that in California or New York? Or how, Help me with that. How, how, do I, how do I really compose that? We haven't done it in California. <laughs> uh, that was I, easy. I, I hear Alabama has just adopted some legislation that is about proficiency-based uh, funding rather than seat time funding. I mean, we, we have exit exams that we measure that students have to pass in order to get their diplomas. And just again, uh, the question is, uh, there, there are now 350 million federal dollars chasing around a new set of exams that are aligned with the Common Core standards. And the question seems to me is, which of the skills and, and knowledge we want to test and make sure we have tests that do it? But I, I, don't, I don't know any other way to do this. I mean, but you don't have a percentage or anything indicating what is mastery. Yeah, no, I mean, we do. In fact, we, we just got pretty well beat up on it in New York because it used to be 30 questions out of 50 was mastery. Okay. And our state decided now that 40 out of 50 is mastery. And you know what happened? Fewer kids mastered the <laughs> subject. And no, no, and, now, and everybody says my scores fell. Well, my scores didn't fall. It was a passing grade that fell. I think this is going to, what the whole Common Core Standards thing is about and the new assessments that they plan to align behind it is to try to say that when a student exits high school, he or she is prepared for college or career and they're going to have to have measurements that assess that. Today in America, I don't know Oklahoma, but certainly in New York, even though we've decreased the number of people who need remediation when they go to college, we still have a significant number of kids who need remediation when they go to college, which basically means we haven't completed in K-12 to what we need to complete. There, there's a great report I'd recommend uh, that INACOL, the International K-12 Online Learning Body, uh, put out uh, about a month ago or so um, uh, about competency-based uh, uh, learning um, called uh, Failure is Not an Option. Um, and uh, they highlight a few districts and even a country, uh, United Kingdom, uh, that has moved to some competency-based learning measures. And if you talk to actually one of the report's authors, Susan Patrick, she talks about going into uh, Shugat's uh, Gotch, Alaska, where they adopted a proficiency-based system, oh, let's say 10 years ago, I think, um, and how when they looked at the standards for the first time, they had to ask themselves, oh, gosh, what does it mean to actually know this, to be proficient in this? And it was actually a pretty arduous process of going through each one and saying, what does it mean? It seems to me that states, as they look at exit exams and so forth, need to ha have gone through that process to, to make sure that there's agreement uh, and, and th that the new assessments that come out and so forth reflect uh, what, what the consensus is on what mastery means. What's the name of the I-N-A-C-O-L.org, I -A -A um, and I'm I -A uh, Mickey Revenant, and Julie Young, if she's here, and I are all on the board and, and would certainly in, endorse reading that. Uh, the, I think a week before that came out, SIIA uh, issued a personalized learning Report is Mark here, Mark Schneiderman. Uh, Mark's organization put out a great personalized learning. Uh, so, so there are a couple of good resources that have, have come out recently. We'd all say it, it, it's complicated policy around it. Um, there'll be a little bit of guidance in, in the Digital Learning Now uh, report that comes out tomorrow, and then. Uh, after that report comes out, we'll begin measuring uh, every state in a, in a, a regular uh, progress report uh, against um, these policies. So 
continue to try to make contributions there, but appreciate the, uh, the, the concerns that it, 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 it's complicated new policies that we need to develop. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Ed Sessler, State Representative from Georgia. I uh, wanted to just ask a difficult question for the panel. Um, Tom had, had kind of raised the, the, the notion of $99 college courses could, you know, right. and, and the kind of the transformative potential of that. Uh, I mean, again, I love the, the disruptive nature of, of, of technology and learning and, and the kind of paradigm shifts that, that are possible. I guess what, what really, what I'd like to put before you was your contention that this is a panacea. Um, I don't think I doubt that it's a potential game changer in many ways, but in terms of a panacea, um, I, I wouldn't doubt the teaching mathematics skills or perhaps grammar and a number of history courses. Right. I mean, it, it only takes me to imagine the Ken Burns Civil War series to think how that engaged me at so many levels in conveying history, which otherwise might be somewhat dry to, to young people. But I would ask you, you, know, when, you when I spend time in classrooms as a state representative, I'm often asked to come in to talk about the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, you know, discussing issues with high school seniors and college kids like natural rights. Right. What does that mean? You, know, you, in, you end up teaching a half class of freshman philosophy when you deal with those kinds of things. Right. And as I engage kids in the classroom, this is, is, is an amateur teacher, just someone that's coming in as an outside speaker. You see in the classroom when you engage kids, you ask questions, what's your belief on this? What's your stance? And then they answer, then, then you ask another kid, what's, what's wrong with that? And you engage these kids and you draw them into a conversation right. that really doesn't just convey information, but draws out of them their own assumptions to really create this sort of changing of the mind, this whole right. trans, the whole, that whole process. Um, I don't know that, that I'm persuaded just yet that technology can do those kinds of things, so speak to yeah, me so how give us a it chance. can be a panacea. Uh, so my, my ideal picture of a, what a great blended school is is playlists and projects. It, it's, it's an extension of school of one, but across the curriculum where we have a very smart uh, computer-based learning platform that helps build basic skills. So you can spend more time with teachers and in working community-based learning, interacting with, with people like you around big questions. So it, it's uh, as, uh, more, more at lunch talked about iSchool. Great example of a, of a school that, uh, that Joel started and it's individualized uh, skill building uh, online and problem-based learning in teams often connected to a, a community client. So great examples of the, the ability to shift time to higher value add connections with adults in school and in, in community. And I, I, I think technology can en enable more of that, not, not less of it. Yeah, I, I, I jump in on that as well and say, say, say largely the same thing. And I'd give one example also of how technology can facilitate that, even breaking out of the classroom model, which is increasingly the online classrooms are getting better and better and more robust themselves. So there's companies like Illuminate and Wimba that were recently acquired by Blackboard to Tom's theme of lots of mergers and acquisitions coming down the pipeline. They basically set up online uh, virtual places where students interact with other students and can do real work with each other in those environments as well. And there are certain classes, um, if you will, that have taken place online. And, and I remember being in Vermont, I think I was, where uh, a, a teacher came up to me and said, you wouldn't believe it, because I had students here in a class here, and I had students in Utah. And they were grappling with this constitutional question. And they actually both came out on the same side of it. And here they were, these conservative students in Utah and these liberal guys in Vermont, and they couldn't believe that they actually saw it the same way when they argued through it and so forth. And it was actually a huge learning process for them. And so that ability of technology to facilitate those sorts of interactions, I think, isn't uh, to be undermined either. And so I, I, I wouldn't want people to get the impression that technology is just, mm -hmm. you know, click program, start, kid sits down and right. buckles up and starts to, you know, come along for the ride, right? <laughs> Uh, technology is a deeply interactive social medium um, that, you know, Tom and I argue about all the time on Twitter. Um, you know, you can, you can follow it. Uh, and so that, that's, that's an important component of this. And uh, let me just add, as we're not talking about seat time with a teacher. We're also not talking about seat time with a computer. The computer's going to set up some, some operations. The student's going to go away and do and maybe the computer is going to help monitor the progress, but that that joint learning, the community learning, the, the project-based learning is also supported by the technology. And technology is just the tool that helps our teachers hopefully be more effective. We have about ten minutes left, so let's. Uh, 
make your questions brief, and we'll try to make our answers brief as well. Oh, yeah, Andy Hill from, uh, from Washington. Um, so I, I think this is, you know, I'm not, I don't come from an ed educational background, but it seems like a disruptive technology. We talk about it a lot. And if you look at the traditional models of disruptive technology, you have the early adopters, um, you have the existing technology kind of going through a sailing ship phenomenon where it gets better very incrementally. Uh, but fundamentally what happens is the buggy whip manufacturers go out of business. And it seems right now like we have our assembly line schools, uh, they're the buggy, buggy whip manufacturers. They will be in the next 10, 20 years, whatever your predictions pull out. So my question is, and probably to, to all of you, maybe to Joel too, is how do you transition from that? So because right now, the buggy whip manufacturers are the public schools and they're a monopoly. And how do you move to this new paradigm um, when you don't have what, you know, what I would call traditional market forces taking place? Uh, and I, I think you, know, you talked about the, also about the, uh, the teachers. Um, I mean, you've got to start producing a whole new generation of teachers as well. And yep. that may take a generation or two. Great question. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, great question. For, first, just very quickly on the teachers, you're, you're absolutely right, and one of the most distressing things right now is that the teacher training colleges or new organizations that would train teachers for this new world are not, by and large, there are some good exceptions, but by and large are not stepping up to this new reality. Um, to the other question, I'll give you three, and I'll try to be brief, uh, uh, answers or possibilities of how it works its way through. Um, the first is that there's a key reason the book is called Disrupting Class as opposed to Disrupting Schools, um, which is that disruption starts in areas of what we call non-consumption, right, where the alternative is literally nothing at all, so people are delighted with this. In the United States, because it's a monopoly system and schooling is largely compulsory, those areas of non-consumption to start free education models are comparatively fewer, and because it's free, and people don't understand the cost because it's not a direct thing to the pocketbook, it's hard to disrupt at that level, which is why you see the classroom disruption uh, piece by piece on the course level be so significant. So that's one part of the answer and tightening budgets could constrict that further. The flip side of it is if you start to have all of these open courses start to come to fruition with adaptive platforms that can start making them really good and so forth, and you can start to educate children for far less cost, uh, and you can start to snap this into brick and mortar blended school environments and offer an education at fundamentally significantly less cost to the point where maybe it's a private school, maybe it's a public school, who knows. Uh, but the, the child can, you know, we can be doing this for a few thousand dollars, a student, at which point you can subsidize low income kids for free, you could charge maybe wealthier kids, who knows how this plays out you might actually see some real competition there against the traditional model in ways that we don't foresee. The third part of this is that if you think about it from a true disruptive innovation perspective, where would you most expect to see this in the developing world? Right. Emerging countries, right? Where there's millions of children who literally do not have access to an education. And guess what? It's happening. It's absolute right. pure non-consumption play. And in India, Bangladesh, et cetera, it's happening. And it's exciting. What it means from the United States perspective is we've got to be proactive in creating these uh, autonomous areas with new policy frameworks around them that we can prioritize this disruption and do it ourselves. Yep. I, I'll add a quick uh, comment here. I wrote a blog about uh, two weeks ago called How the U.S. Will Blend where I tried to answer this question in, in, in categories of how I think things will flip in the next 10 years. So there'll be learning at home will, will more than double uh, the number of, of new um, and conversion charter schools uh, will grow to four or five million. So between those two, there'll be um, eight or nine million kids. Um, there will be, uh, it, there'll, there'll be a, a bunch of interesting new blends that are started. K-12 is doing a, some flex schools and uh, Mosaic is doing um, um, blended schools. So maybe 10 million kids between all of those but the big market is uh, is converting traditional public schools. Uh, some of it will happen in uh, through the school improvement process, so connections and and uh, connections academy and wireless, and uh, Alvarez are working on a a very interesting blended school improvement uh, model. 
And then I think Terry's uh, story is, is a very interesting part of this where more high capacity schools that see really exciting offers mm -hmm. uh, like uh, uh, IQity, was it Calacuity? Cal 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 they, they see offers like that and, and will have enough internal capacity mm -hmm. to develop a blend on their own. So it'll be a continuum of New school development. Oh, and, and another category. There's about five million kids will blend their own education. So where state policy makes it possible, they'll start taking online courses as an alternative to traditional schools. So between new schools, kids blending their own learning, school improvement efforts, and then higher functioning schools adopting new tools and developing blended models, I think you get to uh, a, a lot more than half of uh, of U.S. kids and by the end of the decade. Yes, sir. Um, Tom, um, I want to take up your challenge. You, you made a bold challenge that you could help private schools. I've got one that closed last spring, I mean last, yeah, in June, uh, and we're trying to sell the property. Uh, i got another one, uh, the couple that picked where, me where up. Where are they? <laughs> what? Where? That one's in Austin, Texas. Okay. Uh, a couple that picked me up from the airport is involved give, in a school, and they're scared it's going to close. Uh, she's so, from uh, Austin and can cat. look at the building. Okay. Um, so how are you going to how are you going to save these schools? So, so what you know what's interesting is uh, more than a million. Um, is that right? That's not right. More than a thousand private schools have turned into charter schools. So that that's the the biggest. Uh, change has probably accelerated the death of urban Catholic education, uh, unfortunately. But a lot of dioceses find out they can rent their building to KIPP for a million dollars a year. And, and so we are seeing a lot of those flip to charters. Uh, what we'll start to see in a few places, is, um, places like New Jersey are having a thoughtful conversation about converting Catholic schools to charter, but retaining the staff and trying to keep as much of the school community intact, obviously without re religious instruction during the day, but, but creating the opportunity if the parish wants to have uh, a before or after school uh, religious club. So th there are gonna be those sorts of options available in more places. And then beyond that, uh, the, the ability for private schools to take advantage of things like Cal Acuity at wh where you can have a really good platform and think about staffing the school in a, in a differentiated uh, and, and potentially distributed way where some teachers are at a distance, uh, is a, a, the, it gives you the ability to think about running a very good school for half of what you, you, you used to charge. Okay, and then the other idea is, I challenge you to have an online course that explains all these acronyms that you've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. So, I, actually, we should do that. Lisa and Caroline, just they ran the, the uh, Raise your hand, Lisa. Uh, Lisa ran 70 uh, Illuminate chats over the last 90 days with, with over 100 members of the Digital Learning Council, and, and we, we'd be happy to run several follow-up chats where we could just run through the report and run through a glossary of terms, and if you want us to run these weekly for the next month, we're, we're happy to do that. So we'll be happy to chat afterwards if that's if that's useful. Can we yes. Get the last question? Sure. Oh, we're having so much fun. <laughs> we are. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Steve Vaughn. I'm down here from Maine, uh, and my question has to do with quality control uh, because in Maine I've got a lot of school boards and superintendents that are sold on this. Right. Uh, we've got you know Maine's rural. It's spread out. We've got declining enrollment. We've got budget shortfalls. They look at this for precisely what the reason you said, which is right. they can provide a better quality product, low price, but. The problem is they're, they've got this huge marketplace out there that, if, if you guys are right, is just going to continue to grow. Uh, how is a school superintendent in, in some small town in coastal Maine supposed to make some decisions about which of the products that we're going to use and, and, and what are we doing on that front to ensure quality control, certification, um, you know, those great, kinds of things? Yeah, great question. We, we had lots of discussions on this uh, online over the last three months. Lots of interest in promoting quality. Uh, but a lot of us that are re think it's really dangerous to have right. governments right. try to help Take us with that losers. problem, right? <laughs> right, right, uh, right. Sort of in the government, I'm here efforts to help. And, and approval, content approval and provider approval efforts yep. are almost always going to turn out to be uh, bureaucratic and then become real barriers to entry and, and will right. stifle right. 
uh, innovation. So the, the tension between how do we promote quality mm -hmm. without stifling innovation, a uh, huge challenge. The answer is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, there, there's a great example of it right now, Florida Virtual School, mm -hmm. where it was mentioned earlier. Um, they get a, roughly 10, 11% of their funding up front just for serving the student. The rest only happens when the student Outcome. successfully right. completes the course. So funding is now tied to completion and successful mm -hmm. completion at that. Uh, in an online system, whether that's hybrid or wh however you want to think of it, where time is variable, you can hold that outcome constant. And so it changes a lot of the options with funding formulas and so forth. So really setting a core structure that focuses on those outcomes, washes the hands of the inputs, how we right, get right, there, right. I think is really, that's uh, the key. Uh, is, is really what is critical. And to a district superintendent who's sitting there wondering, whenever a provider comes to them to be able to say, love to use you guys, right. we'll pay you for, who it, for whom it works. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe not in that stark a way, more of right. an exploding right. formula and whatever else, is just a powerful thing that you can't do in today's textbook world. It makes no sense. And that's the exciting thing about thinking about quality in this world. Right. Well, thank you. I hope you all join me in thanking them for this panel. <laughs>